Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. And we had these two Swedish guys come over and uh, me and one of my colleagues like, right, we're going to make a really big fire and you're going to show us this 3D fog attack thing that you talk about. That's, they're like, we're doing it, but we don't think we're doing it as good as you because you guys say it's absolutely amazing. Um, so we went and sat in this compartment uh, at our training centre and we got a fire going and it was one of them where you started thinking, it's a bit, a bit keen in here. And we gave the branch to the Swedish guy and me and my colleague sat there like going, come on then, show us, like, you know, show us this amazing thing. And basically one of them shuffled to the door, opened it and he just blasted the branch on it and basically just ventilated it. And we came out and they were like, well, why would you mess about and sort of gas cooling something that you don't need to, where you could just put it out? And I was like, okay. And it just showed the evolution from where 3D fog attack, certainly when I joined in 2007, was the go-to firefighting technique pretty much for everything. Right, let's just imagine that we've got a big fire in corner room and we're going to sit here and we're going to gas cool. Like, when are we going to extinguish the fire via gas cooling? The reality of it is, the fire is continuing to create the conditions and all you're doing is you're cooling the conditions. Have you heard the combine harvester analogy? Cornfield, cutting the corn, and you've got a child missing in the cornfield. Do you A, search for the child, or B, turn off the combine harvester, then search for the child? And that for me was like, Eureka, you know, like making conditions better. And, you know, if we open this and we do that, and the reality is if we put the fire out, it'll stop creating the smoke, stop creating the bad conditions, then we can do it. And I always turn around to the recruits and say, look, in every walk of life, you're always going to find people who find something negative to say about everything. It's up to you to make your decisions. I said, just remember that day, on day one, when you pulled that uniform on for the first time and you undoubtedly checked yourself in the mirror and you undoubtedly felt a swell of pride that I'm giving back to my community. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a service that's respected by the public because we still are. It's still an amazing career. And I always said to him, I said, listen, when you get on station or when you bump into people outside a station or in general life who are negative about the career and all that, remember, the career, your career is unique to you. You be you. And you remember that day when you put that uniform on. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. Gary, welcome to the podcast, my friend. How the hell are you? I'm good, Pete. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me on, mate. I'm, I'm honoured, to be honest. Mate, I'm, I'm so glad we were able to get this going so quick, because people will know, like, when we have guests on the podcast, sometimes, well, what people don't know, sometimes it can take years. Not because anyone doesn't want to go around anything like that. We're all just so busy, but you and I kind of caught ourselves crossing paths at the right time in the right moment. Obviously, we, we, we both know Mark and some of the silly craziness he does, and that's one element and avenue bless him of the of the uk fire and rescue service but um if you could start off by giving us a whistle stop tour of kind of when you joined the emergency services and kind of why why you joined i suppose and how you find yourself speaking to me on a saturday morning yeah so i, I suppose i'm a little bit of like a, an outlier to a degree so I, a lot of people i've had a, a lot of interactions with through recruit training or whatever have always said oh yeah it's always been my dream i've always wanted to jump fire service since since being a, a little boy, a little girl, and I, I'm not like that. Um, yeah. So I, I grew up in sort of the north of England, um, and my only goal really in life was uh, due to my lack of being able to be academic through just not enjoying it. Okay. I, I, yeah. wanted to jo- I wanted to join the military, basically from 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 dot. A um, little bit of family history in the military, uh, lots of aunties and uncles. Uh, I didn't really feel like I fitted into many sort of social groups at school and things and and basically from the age of about 13 14 everything was just uh ear- earmarked towards the military uh saw all the saw all the fancy recruitment videos that involved skiing and football and things like that and thought do you know what it gets me away from that it get, yeah it gets me away from here and yeah and a little bit of that so so my journey to the emergency services really came 
I, I dare say a little bit out of necessity, um, as opposed to like a real sort of desire to join the emergency yeah, services. Yeah, yeah. Um, after my military career came to an end, that as as most people do when you get a little bit older, I, I couldn't leave the military and spend time sitting around, so I had to get a job. And mm-hmm. I firstly got a job in the private sector of the prison service, and um, that was enlightening. Uh, and then um, I saw, I saw that's beginning. hard. My uh, father in law did, I think he did eighteen years in the military, and then he did twenty years in the prison service. Um, and that, even though people think, oh, you're disciplined and it's about rules and it's uniform, whole different sector to move into. And he. Uh, he, he struggled with it a little bit in the first couple of years. I remember him telling me moving out of um, of sort of the military, uh, the, the department that he was in, because he was to do with something with code breaking, or he used to work somewhere where he could never use any phones. He never talks about it, even though he's in his 90s. I'm like, dude, you can tell somebody now. It's not a state secret. You'll be fine. But um, he still keeps it quite close to his chest. But I mean, tell us the, the real difference of switching those um, sectors, because obviously you stayed there for a brief time before finding a home in the military services. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'll be I'll be open. I've been very open about it in the past. Uh, I really struggled with the transition from the military to to sort of civilian life and then into the emergency services. And I think part of that was because all I'd ever seen myself doing was the military. And mm-hmm. as as happens in all walks of life, you you kind of have these grand plans for how your life pl- plans out and and things change. And um, I never planned for anything outside of the military. I was that kind of guy mm-hmm. who was like, twenty two years, this is me. I get to twenty two years, I leave. Uh, you know, I'll. Yes, Even that short, spin. though. You know when people yeah, say that? Yeah. They're like 20, yeah, you, you'll, you'll be what? You'll be 35, 40 when you leave. You're not even halfway through life. You know what you're going to do for I, 40 years? I turned 39 this October, and mm. this would have been my 22nd year. So this would have been my mm. sort of retirement now. Um, but yeah, I really struggled with it. Um, I think twofold. One, the, the real differences between civilian street, the military, Mm. the prison and then even the, the the emergency services after that but also that i was kind of trying to find myself again because i always been the i always been the soldier that i wanted to be and yes, suddenly man. i've been stripped yes. i've been stripped of that uniform and now i'm not that so so what we i'm making so much of our identity don't we yeah absolutely and like Weird. yeah very very strange but uh, and i think the, the military and the fire service are very very similar in terms of mm. Uh, you can become quite institutionalized to it, but yeah. I suppose the way I could explain it is the military is like the fire service, but on steroids because you live, <laughs> breathe, <laughs> you live, breathe, and, and like you know everything is work. So you live on yeah, camp, yeah, yeah. you you associate with people from the military, and and when you step out of that, even after just six years for me, it was um, it was difficult. I'll be honest, it was difficult. I remember walking out the camp gates um, and thinking, right, and sort of now what? I had a job to go to, but I was like, right, okay, so I'm not part of that gang anymore. So. So now what? It now is what? that, isn't it? As much as we say like, oh no, you know, well, these are my mates and I'll still do it. And they don't like, but I don't know if what your situation was like, I wouldn't pretend to know, but it's like people don't inherently try and distance themselves, but their life is still going on. You know, and you yeah. see this when people retire from the fire service, it's like they just don't see people anymore because we see each other because we're at work. Yes, we're mates at work, but we are mates outside of work, but you still, you just don't see them anymore. And that kind of time distance does create an unspoken void because that person is still doing the thing every day and they're not maliciously not having contact with you but you just kind of come adrift don't you yeah yeah 100 um and and that was one of the biggest things i had to get my head around when i first left because you know mates for life that old that old saying that comes with yeah, joining yeah. the military and 100 percent the mates for life but it's like you say once someone's not there anymore it's not that it's a, a conscious effort to forget them it's just they're not there anymore they, yeah, they yeah, are, yeah. are ultimately forgotten about um yeah. and what I, I think happens around the military as well is it goes through like sort of phases in time where you have uh, association with a particular event in that time so like around my time was uh sort of the last gulf war and, and tours of iraq and you get that bond from lads who you, lads the last who, you, who you've been on them tours with and you know you've always got that common ground or something to talk about and then, obviously, when I left in sort of two thousand, late two thousand six, early two thousand seven, uh, the war in Afghanistan really kicked off for the British yeah. uh, British troops, and that kind of became the new. Um, they all went off, and then when you them in five years, they were all talking about that, and you're like, "Oh yeah, is that, everybody remember the other thing?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah. yeah. And then they're talking about the thing again. Yeah, and you yeah. weren't there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Um, and then that took me a bit of time to really get me around. Um, and you start questioning yourself and you start, you know, potentially overthinking and things like that, which I definitely did. Mm. Uh, but then I kind of began to see it for what it is. And the, the weird thing is that since, I mean, I've, I've been out of the military now for almost 17 years and wow. I've, I've unfortunately had to visit funerals and stuff of lads who I served with um, like pretty recently. And it's really funny that I dropped back in with the, the lads who I was with then. And it's like nothing's changed. It's like I've never been away. It's like, you know, the, the same banter, the same, 
So yeah. everything it's like like you know we're all a bit grey, a bit fatter. Um, there's lads with <laughs> yeah. a bit more um, a bit more scrambled egg on the shoulder, but uh, but ultimately <laughs> it, it all just falls back to the same thing. And it's, yes, uh, I suppose that's the beauty of it. And, and it's they're the, the best one. Yeah. I have it, mate. Yeah. So honestly, yeah. some of the, my closest friends are people I've met through the podcast, and ironically, some of them I've never actually met. I met somebody for the first time like a month ago who I've been friends with for over two years. We've had loads of great conversations. And then I finally met him for the first time. And it's like I'd known him for 20 years. You know, yeah. me and their family went and did a hike somewhere and we stayed over in, in a caravan and, and had a right laugh, cooked some food together. They're the best relationships. Yeah. But you do have those moments where you meet again for the first time after a year or two and you're like, oh God, I wonder. And then five minutes in, it's like you never left. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So, so yeah. So my journey to the emergency services was probably a little bit different to, to a lot of people I speak to. Mm. So yeah, I joined the uh, private sector, the prison service for a bit. I only did a very, very short time. I was transporting prisoners from from prison to prison when they were being moved for visits and recap guys and things like that. So I did that for a bit. But if I'm really honest, the pay were rubbish and the working conditions weren't fantastic either. Um, and then I saw the brigade that I'm I'm part of now uh, recruit, yeah. and I thought, you know what. I can see the, the parallels between the fire service and, and the military and maybe that's where I can sort of go and find myself again and, and, and um applied and, and then yeah, found myself on the on the recruits course sort of early two thousand and seven and then been there. But how to- would you have been going into the recruits course? Because I obviously have it now in the training department, seeing different people at different ages and different developments. Some have just come from the RAF in the recent cohort. And they do seem to just get it a bit easier. But I also think that's kind of hard. I mean, some of them are most of them are great. Is that you get the odd dick that even though they get it, they're astonished as to why other people don't get it. But like when you were there, was there anybody else who was like 18 years of age, you know, just coming out of school and it's like, wow, we've had different life experiences. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I always remember <laughs> us first day on the course, they were like, uh, partner up with someone and learn something about them. And then you deliver their story. And I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, so. I like sat down with this this young lad who was 18 um, and I was like, right, so tell him something about you, man. And he's like, yeah, um, left school, collected trolleys at Asda um, and then I'm here. And I was yeah. like, okay. And man, I'm really into Call five, of Duty. Yeah, oh, I've got to give five cool. minutes. Have you got anything else like from it than, than just trolleys? And he's like, My no, dog's not name really. is Jasmine. Like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, magic. All right. I'm just scratching my head going, okay, but yes. So I was and he's on the waiting. fifth page of notes for yours. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, okay. yeah, so. and, and, and then what did you do? Well, then I yeah. was just, oh, Jesus, right, okay, one minute. I need another pen. I think I was like 22, uh, 22 23. So I joined the military at, at nearly 17. And I, I actually, I'd, when I joined the fire service in 2007, I'd only officially left the military sort of a couple of months before. So my military service is actually six years, but I actually got out around five and a half. They let me out early to go and get a job. Um, you can go back within like 18 months, can't you? They leave like an open door thing, don't they, usually? Yeah, yeah. I was never, going back. <laughs> no, I never going back. Okay. no chance I was never going back. No, uh, but some people might, because again, they think, they hear about their mate who's, you know, the electrician or their mate who is the manager at the local Sainsbury's and they're like, oh, you know, I could be at home with my wife every day and be on 40 grand a year and that'd be great. And then they go there and it wasn't like they said it was going to be. And like, like again, if you didn't find something other than a prison service, if that just didn't gel for you and you didn't find something else, some people do turn back and go, you know what, I, I headed out over the ridge and I didn't like what I saw. And even though I, it's going to have to put my hand up and say I made a mistake, that they can still, a lot of them can go back, aren't they? Absolutely. And the time I got out, so uh, 2006, 2007, the, the recession was, was was pinching pretty hard, and yeah. you know it was hard to it was hard to get a mortgage. It was it was there weren't many jobs, and, and a lot of a lot of lads I left with around a similar time did go back, and I'm yeah. sort of thankful and and I'm very lucky that I, I dropped into sort of two jobs that um, had a little bit of security and 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 allowed me to have that transition from the military to mm. to civilian life. Um, a little bit more smoother, I think, if I'd have been scrying around for a job and all that type of stuff. Yeah, then, do you know what? I, I might have fell back onto it. It might have been a bit of a crutch to go back to because it, I knew it so well and, and I could do it. Um, but, and to but, some people, as well, sometimes you've got to go and do something shit to realise what you were doing, maybe in military, maybe whatever you were doing before. You you kind of you get complacent. You don't appreciate what you've got. But equally, some people then find the thing they're looking for, which is also great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the, probably... Uh, I wouldn't say, but one of the things where you get some people who are quite young who joined the fire service and they can fall into a habit sometimes of chuntering about how crap it is. And I think, well, before I joined the military, I packed bananas for Del Monte for a bit, and that was shit. Uh, and then I um, I also sold damp roofing to people for a bit. That were also crap. Oh, and then yeah, I spent door six knocking years, like, is a real yeah. character building thing. If you have to go and knock on people's doors, I suggest everybody at some point works in sales in their life. 
because it is rough. Yeah, it is. So, so like now, uh, even when we used to get like you know relieving at three, four in the morning to like a big pile of muck somewhere, yeah. I was like, yeah, but this in like digging trenches in snow on top of a house. Oh in yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. like this, this, this to me is fine. Like I go to bed tomorrow and I get home and it'll all be fine. Yeah, when yeah. you pass them guys and girls on the motorway and they're there three in the morning, you know, knee deep in it, and you're like, that would suck. And I'm sure yeah, someone yeah. would love it, and that's wonderful. But for me personally, I'd be like, I couldn't do that shit. Jesus, I would, yeah, I would really struggle. So yeah, how soon into joining the emergency services, because you obviously had a lot of experience before, did that appetite for going? And Because obviously you're at a station manager level in the UK Fire and Rescue Service now. So, you know, a fairly a fairly logical uh, ascent through the sort of career path, but some would argue quite a quick one. But then again, yeah. if they didn't have a similar sort of background, because people get worried about all these like direct entry stuff going on these days. And they're like, oh, but so-and-so, if that girl comes in at direct entry, she doesn't know anything about it. Yeah, but what if she's already done 15 years in the RAF? And they go, oh, that'd be yeah. different then. And I'm like, exactly. So not everyone's the same. Yeah, um, I kind of did the conventional route, if you like, where yeah. I, I left I left training school and I, I went and did sort of six, seven, seven years of a sort of firefighter driving, you know, BA wearing, cutting cars up, all the really cool Gucci stuff that you want to do when you first join up. And I kind of did that and I flitted around a different few stations. I worked in some of our busier districts, some of our quieter districts. And then I kind of did what I think everybody does that when, I started having kids and stuff. I, I kind of gravitated to somewhere closer to home and, and that type of thing. And, and 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 being really honest, I kind of never had the big aspirations for promotion. I hmm. I basically, if I'm honest, got a little bit fed up. Um, I, we had hey, we'd I had this. Hmm. Me, me and my son had, had uh, me and my wife had had my son, and she was back at work, and I was like working sort of two, uh, four on four off, and then on my days off, I was looking for my son and. You know, babies are like up until a point that basically you just feed them, keep them alive, and they yeah. provide very little entertainment <laughs> to a degree. So I was like, <laughs> I struggled with to... all my kids in their first couple of years. <laughs> I felt like a terrible dad because I didn't think I was getting the chemical reward me- that I thought I should. People talk about it as a really magical time, and I felt terrible because I was like, I'm not this thing's not even got its own personality yet. I just didn't really know what to do. I felt I felt really rough until I spoke to other parents that were like. No man, that changes. You're right. There, it's just, just, it's a small human being. You know, you wouldn't even know if it's yours or not for a guy. For me, I'm just talking about my own personal experience. I was like, I didn't feel a connection, and I, I struggled with that for a while, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, so I, I found myself sort of going to work, sort of going through the motions, getting a little bit fed up, and I thought, you know what, I need, I need to freshen this up. I need to, uh, I need to give myself something different. So uh, I went for a bit of temporary promotion. Got, um, went temporary for a bit. Obviously, the relevant courses went temporary and. Uh, to be honest, it was a bit of a disaster. I went temporary to a station that okay. um, that I very rarely were in the front. Uh, I was always still in the back as a, as yeah. a crew manager. Uh, you get a lot on of pump stations, don't you, where yeah. the other JO is never off. So you're like yeah. a glorified firefighter and you don't really get the exposure. Even worse, because it was one pump and a special. And the yeah. special was basically all our sort of dried sand, high X foam, welfare <laughs> stuff, toilets, that type of thing. And it like mm-hmm. rolled out the doors maybe three times a year. And I was basically just sat gaffering that. And I was like, yep. this is not what I intended to be doing. So <laughs> I actually... I, I'm in charge of the tea wagon. Or is yeah, that, yeah, is that what much, I've asc- yeah. ascended to? <laughs> yeah. So I pretty much chucked my bars in, to be honest, which were obviously... Oh, no. I always remember I always remember the um, I always remember the station manager at the time, who's, who's now retired. I'll say I won't name him, but he said, uh, you do realise, Dev, you're committing career suicide here by chucking these in. You will not get a job in the next 12 months because you're basically like, you know, tapped out kind of thing. And I was like, all right, okay, fine. But I'm not happy. I want to go back to station. So I went back to my original shift and uh, I instantly knew within a tour that I'd made the wrong decision, that I didn't really? want to be a firefighter anymore. So then um, luckily for little, me... Mate, sorry, see that bit there, you're so right. Even though you, you didn't get the exposure you want, I always say to people, an idea is like a balloon. Once you've inflated the balloon, it never goes back to where it was before. Do you know what I mean? You, you can't not... You can't reverse that. You can't put it back in the Pandora's box. Once you've seen there's a little bit more and then somebody goes, oh, now back. It's like being put back in the friend zone after you've slept with a mate or something like that. It's like you can't go back to that. It just never feels yeah. the same again. Yeah, we have, a, we have a bit of a saying at our place. It's like a peek behind the curtain. Once you've got a peek behind the curtain, it's hard to not know what's behind that curtain. Uh, <laughs> hard to not know what's uh, there. <laughs> so, I, uh, I ch- so I chucked my bars and went back and then, like I said, I pretty much straight away knew that I'd made a bad decision. Uh, and then kind of... Luckily for me, I just happened to go detached back to the station that I'd just escaped from, uh, yeah. but as a driver. And I dropped on another lad who I knew, just basically done the similar to me, but he was quite close to his retirement. 
And uh, he said, oh, I thought, I thought you were acting up. And I said, oh, yeah, I were. I said, but I weren't really enjoying it and stuff. And he went, well, I've just bust myself down. Like, why don't you try and come to our place? And I was like, yeah, all right. So um, I had the qualifications for the skill set of the station. And I just yeah, yeah. I basically texted the station manager and said, look, I've heard that you shy exactly. a crew manager. Yeah. Like, can, can I come over? And um, and he got me over. And then uh, I spent about 12 months there. Um, had some pretty pretty decent jobs to be fair, some pretty gnarly jobs, uh, and then went for the process, got promoted, and then eventually found my way into training school. And again, I, I begin to look back over my career and think I'm a little bit of like a um, a product of just opportunity. I went in on a mm. I went in on a course to training school. I think it was quite well known that I'd I'd wanted to go into training school at some point. I'd wanted to uh, to to teach and to help and and support people and things like that and. I went in on a course and I got approached again saying, look, Dev, I'm, I'm trying to get out of here um, and I can't get out until someone comes in. And I've heard you might want to come in. Do you want to come in? So I was like, oh, I need to go and obviously have a discussion with my family because I've got um, a daughter by this point. So I've got my son, my daughter, and my wife. And I sat down with my parents. So people, I mean, people don't realise that. It's good to say that people don't realise a lot of training development centres work on like a nine-day fortnight or they work a nine-to-five. So it is, whilst it's usually a bit of a pay rise, I know most places get like a 12%, sometimes additional, but it is a big change to your day-to-day -day life. If you do do something outside of it, whether it's sports, recreation, you run another business, you've got to jack some of that in. It is, it's got to make room for it. Uh, we do in hours five on four off, so you still get your four off, but wow. like where our training centre is, is, compared to where I live, is still... It's thirty miles away, so it was a sixty mile round trip for me every day. Oh, um, yeah, but it was it was something I wanted to do, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity. If I'm honest, I wanted to, I wanted to work with recruits. That was ultimately why I wanted to get in training school, and that, it's always made me laugh over the years when I was in there when people come in and go, oh, "I can't wait to work with recruits." And I went, "All right, get free first recruits course." Then we'll have a discussion again after that because again, the work and the commitment, and it's almost like doing the recruits course again with the recruits. Um, yes. So. People are so used to working with people that are already slightly competent human beings. I'm not saying that recruits aren't, but you make so many assumptions about what firefighters are like. But with recruits, because they've got no context to put any of the information into, they do random stuff that you just couldn't even think they would do because you're so conditioned to what you would expect somebody to do. So it, the cognitive load that you expend, I think, on the first few modules, the first few courses, is significantly more than if you're then teaching you know, BA or RTC or Rope Rescue down the line because you've got to watch them all the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what always used to make me laugh were some of the questions you'd get where you were yeah. like, I have no idea where that's been plucked out from uh, <laughs> yeah. and I don't know Great the answer question. to it, but I'll no find idea. out and I'll come back. Um, <laughs> so it's like, you know, like you'd, you'd go through, I don't know, uh, you know, an LPP, for example, go for an LPP and like yeah. well, normally you go through a crew in LPP, pretty much say, right, Right, come on, lad, lasses, so tell me a bit about the LPP. And they can pretty much guide the learning to a degree. Yeah. You know, they, they, they know it and you can steer them back on and things like that. Whereas with recruits, you'd be talking through an LPP and you, you might talk about, you know, the primer. And they'll yeah. say, well, what's it made of? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll find that out for you and I'll come back to you. But like, <laughs> yeah. not a question that anybody else would come up with, but they seem to Because you don't want to be the parent that just says, because I said so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's not help. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and also I don't think that I've, I've never. My stance no, always in training school has always been to if I don't know the answer, teaching recruits whole yeah. time on call. If I don't know the answer, I'll only them said, you know what? I don't know. I'll find out though, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, because I feel like it it builds credibility. The fact that 100%. you're not saying that I'm the I'm the oracle because nobody is the oracle in all no. honesty. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, um, but, yeah. So I found myself into the training center, and then I'll, I'll be really, really honest. I'm in my 17th year now. And, the best time of my career, a hundred percent, the best time of my career. Um, the hardest I've ever worked, the hardest I probably ever will work from yeah. a physical point of view, but undoubtedly the best time of my career. Because if you don't do the thing, usually, even though no matter how big or small your training department is, even you know LFBs and the capitals of the world, and you know larger West Mids, whatever, it, big training schools, there's still no one coming on after you. It's not like you can hand it over to the night shift. Do you know what I mean? You right. have got you've got to stay late to get the thing done. You've got to come in early to prep the course, to unlock everything, to prep the scenario, to load the build, load the buildings, whatever it might be. That's not going to happen if you don't do it. And then it's everything else because you micromanage that person if they've got a learning difficulty, if they can't get somewhere, they've got a PPE issue, they've got, and you have to do all of that for them. Then you mm -hmm. you take on all of that. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, I kind of prided myself to a degree of being like that bit further for you 
if you're yeah. struggling, I'll help you. If you need a phone call, yeah, you know, I'll help yeah, you. Yeah. Like pop even out to with that recruits, station at seven at night, yeah, and then I'm going to go yeah. there on the on the Sunday morning, and it's all those bits, yeah. Yeah, and I don't really know where that comes from, to be honest. I know people listening might think oh, it sounds like a bit of a big time of this guy, but but yeah, no, it just it just kind of like um, yeah. ingrained in me a bit. I felt like I had a duty as a as a yeah, training instructor because of the words they're just out there like, adrift, and they'll politely say, "Oh, well, you know, if you can't, that's fine," and I'll do, and you're like. Yeah, but then who else is going to do it? And you're not the savior of the fire. Neither am I. Nobody is. But it's like this person's experience is going to be, I've asked once and the service, whether it's you, me, whoever, said no. They didn't say it maliciously. They just said, oh, well, you didn't get it. Don't worry about it. And they'll go away feeling like, oh, that was a bit shit. Or I didn't get what I wanted. Or I didn't feel supported. And that'll affect their whole career. That'll be part of the story they tell one day when they're like, yeah, my, 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 you know, my induction wasn't really that great. You know, the guy said he'd do stuff and he didn't do it. And I kind of felt like just left to my own devices, to be honest. And that's terrible. Yeah. yeah, hundred um, <clears> percent. <throat> don't, don't get me wrong. There's, there's definitely been times I think oh, I could have maybe done a bit more there, but yeah. but that that's just, that's reality. That's life. I, I probably were a bit guilty of spreading myself a bit thin from time to time where, um, <laughs> you know, they'd be like, Oh, we need, we need someone in to do ladders. Yeah. yeah I'll do that. Uh, and then a quick text to the missus. Oh, I'm, I'm working Tuesday now. Yeah, uh, and, and, yeah. And probably, it's okay, you that's know. fine, but you remember you're supposed to be at so-and-so's what's it, or who's yeah, picking yeah. up him now, yeah. and you're like, oh, yeah. can you just, and you're like... Yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so found my way in there, and then we're, our training department's quite unique, because we don't get the pay rides that you talk about, we just carried the rank oh, in there. Brutal. Um, yeah, so we work five on four off in there, um, you, you carry your rank, um, but... Also, we teach every subject, so yeah. we don't have a sort of BA department, trauma department, uh, you know, um, working out department, that type of stuff, water department. We have, like, just a general instructor mm -hmm. um, who teaches literally everything. So my first three, four months in training school was just a blur of the fire service college, yeah, course yeah, after yeah, course yeah. after course after course after course to get me to a level where I could at least yeah. help out on courses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, then, and then, yeah, so I, sp I spent the first... 12 months flitting between the fire service college and teaching recruits um, with one of the senior hands. And then very quickly as it happens in training and development center and in the fire service in general, a big quick churn of, of, of instructors. And then I kind of blinked and I'm a, I'm a temporary watch manager and suddenly I'm the old hand in training school. And, <laughs> and then, and then that brings, a, that brings new sort of, that brings new challenges then where suddenly people are looking at you for guidance, looking at mm -hmm. you for, but sort of being as close to the oracle as you can be, and yeah. uh, and suddenly that that person who you look towards, you're that person. Um, yeah, hundred percent. And then and every then now and again, sometimes you'll come across a course, or they'll try and reinvent a thing, and you'll go back to look at the materials, and you'll be like, "This is fourteen years old. Shit, yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. got to rewrite all this, or I've got to go out there and try and deliver this in a week's time." And you're like, "Oh no, why did we pick yeah. this one back up?" The, the funny thing now is, uh, obviously, my role now I see quite a lot of people, and occasionally there'll be the oh, that were a right load of rubbish that you used to in training school. And I have to be like, well, kind of wrote that, guys. Uh, <laughs> and this is the reason why it were like that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, it's just the evolution of evolution of training, really. Yes. But, uh, but yeah, like I say, I, uh, I, couldn't, um, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't sort of have enough words to say about how fantastic that period of time in my career were in terms of but also from alert, up, learning. You know, We brushed over the fire service college there and there's lots of places and facilities and organizations that deliver the instructor courses, but that's a wonderful getting your head out of your own service and going to learn how things are done in different places. And the people that you meet in the network you develop through that can also feed you for the rest of your career as well. That's really a useful um, professional development aspect that I think a lot of people don't think about going into the training department. Yeah, and I always remember um, years ago, uh, a gaffer saying to me, like, networking is quite important in fire service. I remember thinking at the time, like, networking, to be it honest, just sounds, sounds a bit, a bit like ass kissing. It? Yeah, it sounds a bit, <laughs> a like, bit yeah. like ass kissing. Um, but um, and now, sort of seven years on from joining training school, I absolutely see the merit in it because now, and particularly in the role that I, I moved into as a station manager initially, I had that availability to just pick up the phone, text somebody in another brigade in the, like yeah. the South of England, the North of England, Scotland, you know, wherever and go, yeah. guys, what are you doing about this? Yeah. And like, they come back and go, oh, we're doing this, this and this. But the benefit of having it at sort of your level as well, that you get, you get the real ground truth as opposed to, yeah, 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 yeah. if you're sometimes you networking and you think it's like senior leaders with a cup of tea in their hand going, hello, I'm really important. Are you really important? Yes, I'm really important as well. Great to meet you. But it's not like that. You know, networking yeah. is just, sat on the back of a truck between a drill and you just you just shooting the shit you're just chatting about whatever and you learn about their brigade and their people the good the bad the ugly how they overcame it 
that's networking, you know, which just the term we give it sounds a bit businessy, doesn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you've hit, you've hit the nail on the head there, yeah, 100%. And the guys who I met on my, my courses down at Fire Service College, because I did a lot, and, and not only there, but sort of with uh, what rescue training and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I'm still in touch with a lot of them now. Some of them are even retired, but I'm still in touch with them um, because, you know, you grow that bond and almost because you're not from their service and they're not from your service, they're even more interesting because they're like different. Yeah. So you're like, all oh, right, I really, I'm really interested in what you guys do about this. And, yeah. you know, I had some, had some great debates over, normally over a beer about how their policy is slightly better than ours and ours are. Yeah. It's not as and good also, as theirs. And you get equipment. stuck in an echo chamber. Because you can zoom out, and I'm not talking about GDPR, but you trust them because there's no point in them telling anybody anything anyway because they don't know anybody in your service. And you can like ask them about this and that and not necessarily say people's names, but say, look, you know, we've had this or we failed somebody for that or we're starting. And they'll go, oh, has nobody read this document? Oh, why don't you send one of your letter to it? I'll email you this thing over. And you're like, oh, good. Because we were all stuck with our blinkers on, staring inside our own service. And we just didn't have a chance to zoom out. You know, you spoke about the... um electric vehicle stuff before we before we went live today and like that, that's my attempt to, again like like the whole podcast does just drag somebody in who is genuine subject matter expert he didn't know anything about well he knows lots about the fire service but he's not a firefighter you know but it starts first and then you go you know what yeah 20 40 80 percent of that's useful and the rest of it doesn't apply to us or he's talking a lot of rubbish but so much of it is useful to just throw that into the cocktail of your mental you know churn and go you know what we'll use a bit of that and then we'll throw the rest yeah. away yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. And I think that's what I think that's where the value is in the emergency services in general. I mean, you know, now incidents with you know multiple agencies and things like that, and we do a lot of multi agency training, and and that's got massive value as well uh, in terms of mm. we've got yeah. paramedics come to do RTC training, and they they sometimes go, wow, we didn't even know you could do that, and and yeah. we kind of just thought you chopped the roof off, and we were like, well, no, we can offer you this, yeah. and we can offer yeah. you that, and just ask and us. You know, if you ask us to do the thing, well, of course, we, oh, well, we thought we'd never seen you do the thing, so like. We didn't know if it wasn't your job. No, it's just you never said. Well, of course we can do that. We don't mind. <laughs> the thing is as well, once you build them relationships, them relationships like sort of carry on. So, you know, like I I, am, I know one of the pilots from a local air ambulance, which is, you know, it's... Oh, mate, I'd love to have him on. That'd be a great chat. Uh, to see what he's like, definitely. but like well, that yeah, is he's, uh, he's, not gone into. He's an ex-squad as well. He's got some great oh, tales. Um, so, yeah, I'll put him in. But, um, but, yeah, you know, like even that, just building them little relationships where... I can pick up. I can pick up a text. Text them and say, you know, what time do you guys fly till? Like, is there ever a time when they've not got a, a doctor on? You know, do you guys carry blood? You know, things yeah. like this. Where at times you're like at training centre, you might get, oh well, what the what the uh, heli med do, and you're like, oh, well, I can find out for you, and just you know, yeah. and that's from courses and 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 incidents and things like that. And I, I really think that. But yeah, when you're at an incident and somebody goes, well, our next plan for this worst case scenario is we're going to call heli med for ABC, and you can go. I will just 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 throw my hand in the air there, boss. I mean, they don't actually do that, or they haven't got that facility. So we might need to maybe just consult with them, or I'll speak to control, or because they I don't they don't do that. Last guy I spoke to a year ago, he says they won't do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, People right. have said like I've had crane rescues before, and they're like, we'll just call in this, and I'm like, they don't fly at night, and the wind speed up there at the minute, they wouldn't fly in it, just because yeah, yeah. you know yeah. my brother-in-law does it. So it's like, <laughs> you know, maybe I'll, I might be wrong. But it's worth again throwing those things into the cocktail. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, that, that cross pollination, uh, I know we can tag it with Jessup and all that, but yeah. even like di- dial away from all the sort of big fancy words and things. But yeah, just, just being able to talk on a human level is yeah. is is important. And Super and you important. know, and, th- and them guys are the same as well. Um You haven't got to wait for a formal regional meeting of Jessup to just ask these questions and just just shoot stuff out there into the, the atmosphere and, and see what you get back. Yeah, exactly, hundred percent, and um, and yeah, my time in training school definitely, definitely helped with that. Um, yeah. I, I did a PHCLS course in up in Liverpool with a company, and like there was literally four of us. We were the only firefighters on it, and the rest of them were trauma nurses, paramedics, doctors. Like, and I'll, I'll be honest, like the second day, I remember thinking, like, the, no, in fact, the, 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 the it was a four day course, and the first day was particularly put on for firefighters, which was basically just to explain or the medical teach that they were it's going to talk just about. bring you up so you can participate yeah. in the next few days because you sit there and go, what am I doing in this room? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, weird, the weird thing about that course, well, we, uh, firefighters, we actually seeded throughout the course sometimes better than the people who had this massive skill set because we just kept it very basic because mm. we didn't understand the complexities. Mm. So we kept it basic and sometimes 
keeping it basic is just what you need. We can yeah. we can talk about all the fancy stuff and complexities. And, you know, you start talking about you know, like sort of PHTLS and you can, you know, you can talk about, you know, uh, tension pneumothoraxes and things like that. Reality is it's a chess problem that we can't really, as firefighters, we can't do much about the incident. Just yeah. try and identify it and get them away. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, like things like that, courses like that. And I'm still in touch with some of them guys from, from that course as well. So again, you've got that sort of quick text. Has this changed? You know, like yeah. we were talking about this on the first aid course. Is this still the case? Or has that changed? Or, mm. You know, and, and it, I think it, it, it's worth its weight in gold. It's, it, it really is. And, 100%. Um, I think it's definitely evolved in the time that I've been in training school, out of training school, in, in terms of I feel like we, uh, certainly my service, work much, much closer with, with partner agencies and, you know, even councils and things like that. Mm. We're, we're much more aligned now compared to what we probably were when I were a firefighter. One of the things we spoke about before we came on, I'd love to go into a little bit of detail about because we had uh, a few conversations recently. We've not released one of them, actually, but it was uh, the inventor, Michael Reich, Dr. Michael Reich, sorry, the inventor of the smoke curtain. And he was talking about methods of ventilation and he was talking about Grenfell. And I was just like, I just shut up because I got lost very quickly in that conversation. <laughs> very, very smart guy. But it did make me think again about um, how long it's been on the podcast since we spoke about some of the TAC vent stuff. And in a lot of services in the UK, we're still jumping between different phases and our aversion to, to offensive um, tactical ventilation. Now, I, I'm by no means a subject matter expert. I know you've obviously done your instructor course. I've got mine, I think, later on this year, yeah, in October, I think it is. But um, your service, uh, I don't think you you guys and girls don't do uh, offensive either yet, neither do we. We kind of moved away from it. People worry about losing buildings and losing control of stuff. But I just wanted to explore that from your time as an instructor about your thoughts on where we're kind of at with it. Um, we've obviously lost a lot of experience across the UK Fire and Rescue Service. So how we've adapted for that in our aversion to to maybe using offensive, you know, um, ventilation techniques. Yeah, I have a bit of a, like an evolution with TACVEN and offensive PPV. So we're, we're actually bordered by a lot of brigades who do offensive PPV. And obviously mm -hmm. we have cross-border incidents where we have memorandums of understanding to allow them to still use offensive PPV with us there. Okay. Um, and my evolution is that I saw PPV offensive. Uh, I'm not going to say use wrongly, but uh, having... Uh, a bad outcome as opposed to unintended, a good outcome. Yeah, result. Yeah, an unintended outcome, and that and that kind of planted the seed in me where I was like, I don't, I don't really like this. This looks dangerous to me. Where we're yeah. pumping air, we're pumping oxygen into a fire, and you know the very simple terms is air makes it get bigger, less yeah. air makes it get smaller. I waft the thing, it get smaller the thing again. gets bigger. We can yeah. have seen that from Indians wafting fires, you know, yeah. hundreds of years ago. So then we think, oh, let's push some more stuff at the fire, and we go, no, nah, surely that's wrong. So I went into training centre and like I said, we were still only using um, sort of defensive tactics, smoke clearance, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and I went into training school and uh, as you are, they put me on the tack vent instructor's course and I was like, I was a bit determined, got a bit of too material. I was like, right, you lot are going to prove to me that this is good. <laughs> yeah. So I've decided yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's not. And like, I'd, I'd wrongly come to the conclusion that it's, it's really dangerous and I'd seen it go wrong and all that type of stuff. And, and yeah. I went down there and I remember bumping into some guys from Hereford and Worcester uh, and they'd had to PPV for quite some time uh, offensively. And they were like they were like ninjas on our course. I was like really, really impressed with how it was just second nature and they were absolutely bang on with it. And um and I went down there and I, I said to one of the colleagues I went down with, I said to, I said, look, um, I want them to prove to me that this is good. I said, so everything that they say we can do, I'm doing. Like so when they say you can stand in front of the fire um with offensive PPV as it's blowing the product combustion out the open vent. I can stand there and open the branch. I said, I am standing there and I am opening the branch. I says, and I'm gonna like I'm gonna yeah. absolutely satisfy myself that this is this is as yeah. good as they say. It's it. like when someone tells you something, you go, see, feel how smooth that was, and you did it and it felt horrible. And then you go, Yeah, yeah, that felt great. And you're like, I'm not doing that again. It's yeah, like exactly. I'm, I'm not gonna play that game where everyone goes, Yeah, that was really good. And back in mind, they're like, I was a bit of shit. I'm not gonna do that myself. <laughs> yeah. So I, I almost became that that you don't really want on the course sometimes. He was like, no, I don't believe you. Prove it. So we did the the first day, they take you down and they, they put, uh, build a fire and you're sitting there as you do on your, as yeah. you do when you first join the service where you start talking about paralyzation and lowering neutral planes. And look, I open this door and the neutral plane goes up for a period of time and then the fire suddenly gets bigger and we get a clean burn and all them types of things that we talk about in fire behavior world. And then they're like, right, we're going to put this fan on uh, and we're going to open that vent and we're going to rattle it out of the vent and then you lot will be able to stand up and take your glove off. 
um, like hold your hand up in the air and it'll show how amazing like the conditions are. And I was like, okay, I'm taking my glove off. Like I'm not none of this yeah. like peeling the cup. It's coming off. Yeah, and, and just, I'm standing just there keeping it up like a shy yeah. child. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, if you burn me, it's your problem. You've told me this is amazing. So yeah. we went in and I did it and I was like, yeah, it's pretty damn good to be fair. And then <laughs> as the obviously as the course evolves and you start getting involved in then you sit it firefighting in, in sort of an offensive way. And I mean, even such as that, so for the listeners who may not be in the fire service, there's sort of three phases to it. One is very much defensive where the fire is extinguished and we just use it to clear smoke. Um, the second one has two elements to it. It has a defensive element and a, and a, a sort of attack element. The way I remember it, because I'm a simpleton, is anything that has an effect on the fire is in an attack phase. Anything that doesn't affect the fire is in a defensive phase. I think that's kind of an easy way I remember it. Yep. Um, and the very thought of just turning up, putting a fan in and looking for a push at a vent without anything else really like blew my mind for a bit. I was like, so just run this by me again. There's definitely yeah. a fire in there and we're putting a fan in. And and eventually... Before we've got like, eyes on it. Before we've yeah. got somebody next to it with a branch, before we've located there's only one seat, we're just going to fan it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, it took me a long time to get me... Not, not a long time, a couple of days and a couple of ways to get my head around and go, well, actually, do you know what? If we put it in and we get something that we're not expecting, we can just turn it off. It doesn't have to stay there forever. And I was like, Unless you're too right. proud and people are like, no, I've decided we're doing offensive. And you're like, okay, we're going to lose the building. <laughs> so um, so that really was like the, the sort of penny dropping moment of this is an in- incredible tool used correctly. You don't have to rely on it. It's not. It's not the go-to. It's not the gold standard. It's just an, another option, another... I think it relies sort of, heavily on sort of, um, confident, competent, and assertive BA wearers to quickly, once you've got an established you know, fire and you're happy you know where it is, you can who rapidly make progress in towards it. Because it does, yeah. Yeah, it clears conditions. It, it theoretically, therefore, makes your search procedures quicker and more efficient and safer. But you do still have to make progress so we can get to the thing at yeah. the quickest possible. You know, you can't... If you're going to switch it, if you're going to put it on and you're still just going to meander through the building very slowly, then that's not going to work. You know, if it's fully, you know, fully engulfed, fully enclosed, you know, terrible conditions inside, zero visibility, then yeah, you're going to go very slowly. But the idea of putting the fan on offensively is it should expedite that next process. Yeah, 100%. Um, uh, we, we very train some crews and offensive, and then uh, this little thing called COVID happened and it kind of put pay to it. Um, mm-hmm. So one of the things that we taught on that was um, non-negotiables, so things that need to be in place before you can use it offensively. And mm. one of them was a BA team started up with media ready to go before you put the fan in so yeah. that you speed up that process of not having a, an impact of a fan on a fire without water. Because, mm. again, like we, we said earlier, mm. oxygen makes it bigger in theory. Yep. Water makes it smaller. If you've not yeah. got water but you've got lots of oxygen, you're just going to continue to make it bigger. Um, so we, we incorporated that into, into our teachings. Um, so yeah, so then kind of came away, but it was a bit of a funny one where I came away and then we were still no longer teaching offensive PPV. So I was like coming back, like I'd seen the, um, Ark of the Covenant and saying, this is absolutely (laughs) amazing why we're not doing this. And then still we, um, still we weren't doing it. Um, but what I took away from that was we can still get better at ventilation, just ventilation at its purest form. Uh, you know, not not using PPV, and uh, yeah. a colleague a colleague of mine did a did a degree on on PPV use, um, wow. and mm-hmm. I took a lot from him, and I took a lot from his teachings and the way you went about things, and and you know some of it were probably seen in the eyes of of some crews as being a bit radical because it was yeah. quite a way away from what behind the curtain analogy to. that we spoke about earlier. Once you've been there and seen it, and it's hard to articulate it, and it's hard to give people that same immersive experience just through your words. Because they won't, they're, they're still yet to have the eureka moment. Yeah, absolutely. A bit of time, and it probably takes a, it takes a bit of confidence. And and do you know what? It takes a couple of mistakes as well. It takes a couple of getting it wrong. You know, with people not getting injured and the yeah, correct yeah, safety yeah. systems in place. But it takes it takes showing it how it can go wrong because mm-hmm. you need to still respect it. Um, it's a great piece of kit, and it's it, it's a fantastic technique. But you still got to have respect for it that it can go wrong. Um, in if used in the you know the incorrect way. Um, mm-hmm. or and and sometimes that's even not by any person's um no, malice you know mm. malice it, it just sometimes it happens you know we, we, we work in an ever-changing wrong, environment so. Yeah. yeah so you know it can it can be just a door slamming shut or or anything like that it could could obviously have a, a bad effect so but that doesn't so, mean yeah, you so, take the baby out with the bathwater. it just means you pivot the current approach 
don't go, you know, ram that. We're never using it again. It's dangerous. You just go, no, no, we just, we just, we just did the thing slightly wrong. We just didn't, yeah, we didn't anticipate that little provision there. Once you make a pivot, once you make an adjustment to the, to the recognized procedure, we'll just go again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so that, that for me was where my you know, kind of knowledge of, of ventilation just as it's, itself began to grow mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And I always remember a funny story. We had some Swedish guys come on, some Swedish firefighters, uh, and they stayed with us at our training centre for about a fortnight. And obviously the Scandinavians kind of invented the 3D fog attack, which which prior to tactical ventilation was seen as the the ultimate way of fighting fire, which was minimal amount of water to to sort of... We've had a couple of authors on the podcast, yeah. Really really good fellas. And we had these two Swedish guys come over and uh, me and one of my colleagues like, right, we're going to make a really big fire and you're going to show us this 3D fog attack thing that you talk about. That's, they're like, we're doing it, but we don't think we're doing it as good as you because you guys say it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we went and sat in this compartment uh, at our training centre and we got a fire going and it was one of the ways I was thinking, it's a bit, bit keen in here. Um, <laughs> and we gave the branch to the Swedish guy and me and my colleague sat there like going, come on then, show us, like, you know, show us yeah, this yeah. amazing thing. And basically one of them shuffled to the door, opened it and he just blasted the branch on it and basically just ventilated it. And I was like, there you go then. And we came out and they were like, well, why would you mess about and sort of gas cooling something that you don't need to, where you could yeah. just put it out? And I was like, okay. And it just showed the evolution from where 3D fog attack, certainly <laughs> when I joined in 2007, was the go-to firefighting technique pretty much for everything. Yeah. Um, you know, gas cooling was like everything, whereas... Just continue now, to gas old. cool. I go, okay, at some point we need to fight the fire as well. <laughs> we yeah, just, yeah. Why continue to improve conditions if you could just, you know, put it out and then and then move on? If there's no um, you know, casualty centered rescue that needs to take place, if you just want to make a quick, you know, make the conditions better, get somebody out of there, you're not gonna have time to do a to do an extinguishment and ventilation. But if you're just in there firefighting, yeah, why wouldn't you? Yeah, and it's the other thing in it of like I, I talk <laughs> when I used to teach fire behavior courses to crews used to so right, let's just imagine then we've got a big firing corner room and we're going to sit here and we're going to gas cool. Like, when are we going to extinguish the fire via gas cooling? And they'll all go, I'm um, not sure, blah, blah, blah. So the reality of it is to run out of fuel because the fire is continuing to create the conditions and yeah. all you're doing is you're cooling the conditions, but you're not, yeah. it's like, uh, have you You're heard managing the, the lag effect of the yes. thing, but you're not going uh, to the thing. <laughs> have, you, have you heard the combine harvester analogy? This is a, no, great, a great one. So you've got a combine harvester in a cornfield um, cutting, the, cutting the corn and you've got a child missing in the cornfield. Do you A, search for the child or B, turn off the combine harvester then search for the child? <laughs> and that for me was like, Eureka, you know, like... Yeah, yeah, 100%. Making conditions better and, you know, if we open this and we do that. And the reality is if we put the fire out, it'll stop creating the smoke, stop creating the bad conditions. Then we can do it. Obviously... We know that that's a simplistic view, and in reality, you're not going to do it like that. You're gonna you're gonna do a dual approach where you're gonna have crew yeah. searching for casualties, and you're gonna have somebody to aggressively fight the fire. But also, get the fire out. Questions on incident command courses, though, when they go five, you know, two persons unaccounted for fire in the back bedroom. What's the priority? And the whole room kind of goes silent because some people don't go put the fire out, and other people go, oh, and then you just pose the question to them. But you're like, but aren't we here to search and rescue? We're we're here to rescue life, and we don't care about the building. Remember, life's the first priority, and they're like okay, you know, search for life. And you're like, but you're not going to put the fire out then. Because, you know, if you put the fire out, then any survivability is going to increase. And you just pose that wicked question to them. Yeah, and the other um, the other one I always remember from Fight Behaviour Course as well, and he was actually an old uh, watch manager of mine when I was a recruit. So I think he used to come to try and test me. And um, we were discussing about firefighting and he was like, uh, well, you know, why would you not leave the fire lit to help you look for the casualties? Now, that sounds utterly ridiculous to me and, me and yourself. Um but there used to be a train of thought that that was the way oh, to do yeah. it back in the sort of seventies and eighties. But we Before both reacted. Room, have a look around. Before we had thermal yeah. imaging cameras, that was what that was why they did it back then. Because they were like, use the light of the fire, take a good scan of the room. Can I see anything? Number two will point it out, and then attack the fire. Because as soon as you do that, it's all going to go black anyway. Yeah. So we had this debate, and he was like, "No, I'll leave it lit." And I go, "Right, okay, Eric. Let's use a um, let's use a different analogy." Then he says, "Okay, so we got a room full of acetylene." Um, are you going to take a candle in to search for a casualty? Oh, no, absolutely not, because it's dangerous and it'll explode and, you know, um, acetylene's really flammable. And he said, well, what's the, you know, what's what's carbon monoxide's flammable range? And you you put them on the board and you're like, it's very, very similar. So are we going to leave the fire lit or actually are we going to put the massive hazard out and then search for the casualty? And then 
you know, you talk about the evolution. You then chuck in tack vent on top of aggressively fighting the fire, or you chuck in just ventilation, just natural ventilation, and suddenly <clears throat> you, you've you've evolved firefighting tactics um, mm. to a degree. Um, and essentially, in our training department, led by the guy who did the, the degree, I'll be honest, I can't really take much um, no 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 much credit. Mate, much we're credit all standing the on the shoulders of giants. You and I learned this from somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And and basically, he started it, and we, we integrated it into recruits courses sort of seven, eight years ago, like more aggressive ventilation, more use of ventilation. And since then, it, it has evolved the sort of wider, um, the wider impact operationally. And then it got in, involved in beer courses and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then for, fast forward years later, I, I got um, some temporary promotion into our Grenfell team. And one of my first tasks was to roll out the smoke curtains. Yeah. And, um, so, so I rolled out our services smoke curtains. I didn't buy them, and I didn't write the business plan before anybody who did re- is listening to this and claims <laughs> I'm I'm nicking credit. But um, so I rolled them out, which involved obviously the training and 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 such like. And and I remember not resistance to them, but there was definitely a, an ounce of uh, sort of skepticism. Skepticism to you, you talk about hanging essentially a fly net over a doll. Like what you're talking about, and yeah, it was it was a bit of a difficult one to kind of guide it. That it's not just high rise specific; it's That's specific it, to man. any and incident. This, this episode will come out out now after because we haven't released um, Doctor Reichs yet. But yours will come after it, and it's when he then goes into the depths of bi-directional flow paths that people can understand the principles of how it would be useful in any situation, not just high rise to protect the stairwell or whatever. It's about it's 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 multiple applications and benefits. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And um, I've got a video that I used to show on our Grenfell course. Um, I say Grenfell course; it was you know fires and tall buildings yeah. course, but we obviously tagline it with Grenfell every time. But, uh, yeah, and um, they <laughs> it was a French video, and it showed two scenarios: the same room, one with a smoke curtain, one without a smoke curtain, and basically it was trying to show the protection of the stairwell element. But mm. I used to pause it before it used to show the stairwell and it used to purely just talk about fire behavior, compartment firefighting, you know, you're two up, two down, general house fires that we get mm. and said, this is the benefit of this piece of kit, mm. regardless of protecting the stairwell. And then he used to mm. carry on and said, now look at the protection of the stairwell as well. And now mm. I think we've got to a point in our organization where they're more readily used uh, yeah. than the, what they were when they first came out. And I've almost become like the, the smoke curtain guy to a degree where I now get WhatsApp messages from, watch managers and crew managers saying we've used a smoke and look how fantastic it were. Yeah. I'm kind of like, I can't really claim responsibility for it, but no, yeah, but... they're a fantastic piece of kit. <clears throat> You've got to have those local champions to champion the thing. Cause like, and this is kind of the whole point of the podcast. So many people will never speak to the inventor of the, of the smoke curtain and they won't hear the logical thought process that he went to through, sorry, to get to the eventual creation of what is now the smoke curtain and you know hundreds of thousands of people have purchased it all over the world and there's been variations of it and all that sort of stuff but if you just give people the thing <clears throat> and they don't understand the why behind the thing though sometimes people think oh he's just making trying to make a name for himself like for yourself and like oh he's a new station manager and he's trying to claim this new thing is god's gift to firefighting well no he's probably just spent a bit more time understanding the why behind it that's why he's so excited about it or she but if they don't, if they don't have somebody championing it, and you've got to have those local champions, I always think of them as uh, cultural architects. Do you know what I mean? Where you've got to have those touch points across all different organisations that get it, that get the thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you you could forgive them for not buying into it because they don't understand the purpose. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So yeah, so obviously we we rolled them out, and, and again, it just shows the evolution that we've had over the period of time we've sort of. Uh, my colleague who did the degree, and and it becomes sort of like a multi multi pronged attack on on just improving standards and we've still got some way to go definitely and mm-hmm. i think in the future we we probably will see the um impl- implementation of a phase 3 ppv which would then obviously add a different element to it but i feel like we're in a better position now compared to when i did my instructor course in understanding ventilation as a as an as an entity as mm-hmm. opposed to just sort of not understanding it really and bringing the fans in it, it almost felt like we had to go through that journey if you like to yeah. new techniques different ways of doing things to to, to now, okay, we're probably in a position where we can now start incorporating fans into it as well. It also uh, makes me think, echoing back to the lithium-ion conversation, like now that we've got a lot of fans out there that are powered by electric and the fact that they've got these big lithium-ion things on them means that they can, they're a lot lighter. <clears throat> they're not obviously mm-hmm. kicking out all the fuel that a, a petrol-driven fan is. So you can take it up onto the third, fourth, fifth floor. You know, putting a fan into the bottom of a stairwell of a 20-story building is going to make very little difference on the seventh floor if it's not a positively pressurized 
system and it hasn't had that infrastructure placed in the building when it was constructed. But now we've got something we can actually transport and take to different locations and start to be very tactical about the way we're applying ventilation. That is another evolution because that used to be another question we posed where, okay, you're going to bring that fan in and use it here, are you? Okay, so you're going to bring all those fumes and all that, those additional toxins and the aerospirable atmosphere and you're going to put that that fan in an enclosed environment and switch it on. Well, actually, now you've also got rid of that factor. So you can be more flexible in your approach to using these things. Yeah, hundred percent. And again, that that played into sort of the Grenfell work I went on to do um, after leaving training centre. Um, all of this sort of became basically my, my daily life. If I'm if I'm honest, I became enormously invested in um, in how our brigade, how our service would interpret the recommendations from the Grenfell uh, inquiry, and how we would sort of do it. And it was part of like a little team where it was essentially our day job. So, you know, rolling rolling smoke curtains out and, and things like that. So take us to that that sort of next chapter of your career because we've covered little aspects of Grenfell. We won't go into too much of the detail of it, but there was an, implement, an implementation plan of the Grenfell Tower yeah. Inquiry. It came out of the, the phase one recommendations, I think it was. And I pulled up a, there's a 38-page document that they go into different aspects and we won't bore people with the whole contents of it. But effectively, obviously, the Grenfell Tower uh, was an appalling tragedy for, for Londoners, but also had ripple effects across the whole of the UK Fire and Rescue Service, not just in the Fire and Rescue Service, but how we approach incidents and construction. Uh, 72 people lost their lives in the fire, um, and the, the, a lot of the context behind it was that it never should have spread and and gotten to the scale that it was at. But we owe it to the people that lost their lives and obviously the firefighters that, that worked diligently and hard for so long to try and make the differences but as with all the debriefs that we do we'd be remiss if we didn't try and take on board some of the learnings and the recommendations from it so i think there was 20 no so the first phase report was 46 recommendations yeah and there i think was 29 went to lfb itself but with those give people some context around what actually filtered out to some of the wider services so was it that whole 46 recommendations that everyone was asked to to work on or how many went out to all the fire services um, so within our service, I can only really talk about our service to be honest. Yeah. Um, I did have I did have dealings with other services around us, but um, the, the Grenfell recommendations had been out for some time before we got put in post. If that made sense, so so, mm-hmm. so certain things had already begin begun to happen, uh, but not at a pace that I think uh, our service felt comfortable about. So they they sort of brought a team in to to sort of push this forward a little bit, and, and we were part of that team. There's some people just so, give yeah. a polite nod, don't they? And then you can find six years down the line, nothing's really been done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I think we were, I think if I'm being honest, we were probably in a danger of beginning to do that. Um, we kind of scratched the surface. And I think that when sort it's of our senior... work, it needs people, resources, and, you know, these yeah. people have already got jobs. So when these get loaded onto yeah. services, it's like, okay, who's going to do that? Yeah. So the starting point for me really personally was it became a job advert, um, to be honest. I'd, uh, I'd since passed the watch manager process and I'd expressed some interest in watch manager posts on station. But due to the fact that I was skilled up to the, um, you know, up to the gills and yeah. that nobody really wanted to come into the training department, the chance of me getting out was um, Yeah, was, that's was the thing, isn't so, it? You get painted into a corner. A little bit. Um, I saw the job advert and I thought, do you know what? Operations potentially in the future being a station manager. But in all honesty, this gets me out of training yeah. centre, potentially. And the the... The, the Grenfell thing had interested me as, as in like, I've always had a little bit of a, an analytical mind to look at post incidents and think, how would I do things differently? Mm. Or, you know, would I do things differently? What were the mistakes? And that's not a blame how game. Not it's not that? us saying that the people no, are no. crap, but a healthy, you know, I always say a healthy red team or a healthy debrief team needs to look at it non-emotionally and go, you know what? I think that was wrong. And you said, oh, yeah. you're saying all the firefighters died for a reason or they were just stupid. No, no, no one's saying that. We'd have probably done the same thing at the same time in the same place, but with the beauty of hindsight, connecting the dots, looking backwards, actually maybe we should have done something different. Yeah, so I um, expressed an interest, um, I think due to my training background that held me in um, in a good standing to potentially get it. Got it, temp- temp station manager, um, and then uh, joined a small team that were, at the time was just myself and an area manager um, who were kind of picking it up and running with it. It had a lot of elements to it, so sort of an ops element, um, 
uh, business fire safety element, probably called different things in different brigades, but mm. they're basically the team that do the the inspections around businesses. And That's they exploded got... across the UK. Yeah, there's so many yeah. people, grey and green book staff have been employed to do fire protection roles specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And um, we ran something called the Building Risk Review Team, which uh, basically went round and inspected every single one of our brigade areas, high rise. Mm. So you can imagine that was a massive, massive Did you have to do all your level it. four, level five FP stuff as well for that? So, uh, so what we did is we took we took already qualified fire inspectors out of business fire safety and created this elite crack team. Um, yeah. And basically, they had the skills, they had the experience, and yeah. they went and did it on sort of on the, the services behalf. Yeah, find um, the worst offenders and try and get that low hanging fruit straight away because there's some terrible stuff out there that we just don't have resources to go and inspect. So, so really, in a in a way, it helped us to highlight them potential offenders so that we could put control measures in place to keep residents safe in the short term until they got the issues resolved or until we came up with um, solutions to how we would would deal with that what, building. Could we go there for a second and, and and feel free we can take this out if it's, if like you're not happy to, to speak on, on value with it. But like for business owners and also just for general firefighters awareness, you know when they go to places and they think this doesn't quite look right. When somebody from an inspector at capacity does go, whether it's a fire protection officer, whether it's a fire invest, um, fire inspector, or whatever it might be, just let people know what those provisions are, because you we can bring it into a legal framework and you know actually put sanctions on those buildings or or yeah. force them to close business or whatever it is. What, what are the kind of levels? And I mean, I know you can only speak perhaps from your service, but I imagine there's a very similar aspect in most services. What are those kind of levels that you can impose on on businesses or buildings? Yeah, so obviously I, I don't have massive intimate knowledge. It's just from me, me yeah. time in, in in our team. But say our business safety teams have got legal powers to put prohibition notices on buildings. Yeah, I think in the in the interim, dependent on the level of risk, I think in the interim it would be you know much like a development plan, where it's like a bit of a chat saying you need to get this sorted, and this is the time we're going to give you it to get it sorted, and yeah. you need to put control measures in place to keep your residents safe in that period of time and we're going and so on. through with smoke alarms is step one we're going to get them to fix their doors we're going to get them to yeah. a, you know, move a load of stuff amend some escape yeah. plans all that sort of jazz yeah. yeah that type of thing so yeah again like going back to you know the, the sort of low hanging fruit and then the, the sliding scale then goes all the way up to sort of enforcement notices to, <laughs> to court cases to prohibition orders to to things like that. I mean, I vividly remember being in the Grenfell team and, and getting a phone call on Friday night from the chief fire officer and I was literally sat at home and the phone rang and I thought, this probably this isn't good. good. <laughs> so as I answered the phone and the chief was like, uh, just to let you know, we've basically pro uh, put a prohibition order on a building, uh, yep. a high-rise building. And the chief was ringing me to give me some awareness of it because it actually is in my area where, where I live. Oh, wow. um, so I was like, oh, all right, okay. Um, and then, you know, that that's an example sort of, yeah. the far end of of sort of prohibitions and 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 legal enforcement to to change things stop things uh, and all that type of stuff and uh, i've got i've got to say that the um the business fire safety teams who i work with uh, and on a not a daily basis but in intermittently I jumped in with they put, get, get through a monumental amount of work and oh, yeah. they're um the 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 pressure that them guys are under at times you know because they're suddenly stepping out of a fire protection element and they're into like a legal of legal arena yeah and, and you can you get know, that wrong so easily statements and yeah, yeah and things yeah. like that I remember at times thinking, I'm really glad I don't have to do that because that seems really As a knuckle like... dragging firefighter, you would just gotcha. never had the development. You know, we've never had the exposure and experience in how to operate competently in a in a legal framework and you know, cross all the T's and dot the I's and all that jazz. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, they, them guys, um, the amount of work they got through with the building risk review team and uh, and you know the the commitment they gave to it was was, was phenomenal. To be fair, so so yeah, so the, there was that element to it, and then there was a, a really big control element to it uh, as well. Obviously, from uh, actions from control. So I worked with the watch manager, um, who were the training lead for control, and uh, in all honesty, control in our service had already done lots and lots of work. But where where it's kind of interesting and 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 different is that every control room is slightly different, uh, slightly yeah. bigger, slightly smaller. Uh, slightly different staffing numbers, slightly different equipment, slightly different technology, slightly different procedures. Mm. So with the Grenfell stuff, it, it weren't a case of being able to pick it up its entirety and basically just dump it in your service and say, we'll do this. It had to be quite bespoke to the service. Yeah. Um, and again, our control had done lots and lots of work, but it was like, uh, it was me mm. and the, and I mean, it was a massive crash course for me because literally control to me had just turned me out to jobs for years. And suddenly I'm yeah. sat in control 
seeing how they work, seeing the yeah. the issues that they have, the, the you know, and 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 like again, I've I've got so it's really much hard because they they haven't got the liberty of learning after the fact. They have literally got to have all the up to date information all the time because yeah. they are the the pulse, they are the beating heart of most organisations. Because when it is one in the morning and a brand new crew manager is acting up at wherever, they're going to ring control and go, "What do I do about this?" And they've got yeah. to be able to pull that document up straight in front of them and say, this is the latest, this is what we do. Um, so again, I, like from my time in the Grenfell team, that I got to see these other areas and I got mm. to kind of see the the bigger juggernaut that is a service and how it yeah. sort of, how it functions. And um, yeah, my time in control, I've got nothing but absolute respect for anybody who works in a control room. Yeah, I've, been sat in, I've been sat in there before and um, like they've had a few jobs and they're, they're very busy. And like one of the ladies just went around and said, Deb, do you fancy putting an head cell? And I was like, absolutely not. No, send me to anything. I do not want to get involved in that. That sounds yeah. horrendous. Um, but you're right. So like the guy... They all need to have some similar ways of working because the Grenfell was a typical example where all of the fire survival guidance was just too much even for LFB to cope with. And they punched it out to lots of different control centers up and down the UK to help support that sort of resiliency in the system. Um, and I think that shone a light on all of the different variations of ways that we handle fire survival guidance and how we record it and get it fed back into the system to give the incident commander on the ground that holistic view of their priorities and where people are and what what's the best actions to take and who still needs rescuing and all that sort of jazz. So that shone another light on the fact that we need we need to you know we need to all work a little bit closely together for that cross regional working to make sure we are giving the same product to the to the to the end user to the communities. Yeah, absolutely, and um, yeah, and I think <clears throat> what, what also kind of helped a little bit with the Grenfell stuff is I went in and spent some time in control explaining what we do from an operational point of view because mm -hmm. I think sometimes the guys and girls in control are not fully understanding of what mm -hmm. we do at, at operation. So when I ran the Grenfell, um, when I ran the Grenfell training courses uh, or the the fires and tall buildings courses that we invented. Uh, we invited control onto every one of them. We brought control officers yeah. with us. We That's we made right. them into casualties. We had them being rescued from from flats, and we basically showed them that this is what this is what we're faced with in the first ten minutes of potentially an incident. Yeah. And again, like all all the lads and lasses came away and said, "Thanks for that." I got so much from it and a bit a bit yeah. of better understanding. And even yeah. to, today, I've continued to like, kind of work a bit with control on other incidents, um, yeah. wildfires, and stuff like that to give them an understanding of what we're dealing with out there. Because um, they're trying to do the best they can with what they've got and the people on the ground are doing the same. But there's that there's that void in the middle where what I'm saying isn't making sense to you or what you're asking me to do isn't possible. And I or I just simply don't have time or the reason I'm ignoring you is because of this. It's not out of malice or a, or a disinterest in the value that the control can add to an incident ground. It's, it's, it's just the logistics and perhaps the, they can't see the fuller picture of what's there. And that happens from both yeah. sides. Yeah, and it's just different priorities, isn't it? At the yeah. time, you know, they're... Their priorities are to get the resources there, get as much information as they can, delegate that to the resources, make sure they're structurally in a position where they can deal with the incident, looking at the wider aspects. And then on the fire ground, we're very much on the get the water on the fire, get the resources here, and like the priorities are different. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the Grenfell stuff, and then um, really largely we then had a, a lot of work around policies, procedures, training for whole, for for the crews, um, and I'll be honest, it became a bit of a labour of love because mm. we took the we took the recommendations and we looked at what we needed to get from the recommendations, and then we looked at the complexity of our station area with the you know the size of our high rise and, and all this type of stuff. And then there was obviously an element of uh, a trade union challenge to a service around their procedures, mm -hmm. yeah. and and it, and it really started to like make it quite complex. And yeah. um, that can I sometimes used to just, hurt when you think you're at the getting close to the end of a solution. And you haven't considered the impact on the trade unions. And then they can just, with the greatest of intentions, they just slam a halt on it. And you're like, damn, I hadn't consulted with the right people. So ultimately for us, coming in a little bit later to do it was a good thing because we'd kind of seen these things happen elsewhere. So yeah, yeah. when I when I came in to our team, I, I kind of went on a watching brief for about yeah. three weeks where I just got the lay of the land everywhere else and Great seen shout. some of the issues that people had had and some of the things that people had implemented but maybe weren't too happy about them and things need to change and stuff. And um, and I'll be honest, it was an ever-changing landscape. It was literally changing by the week of different procedures, different policies, different equipment, that type of thing. And, and we got to a point where sort of uh, before Christmas, about two years ago, probably coming up this Christmas, 
where we then have to just stick a sort of flag in the sand and say, right, this is what we're doing. Um, yeah. This is what, as our organisation, this is what we're doing. And um, I, along with the watch manager now in our department and obviously the area manager, um, I designed, we designed um, how we thought it could work, bespoke to our station area yeah. um, within the limitations of what we could provide, within the limitations of our technology, within the limitations of kit and all that type of stuff. And, um I basically came up with this um with this training package with this way of evacuating a high rise residential building that's involved in fire um and no difference to an instant ground is it past a certain point more information isn't going to be helpful you just need to make a decision now you just you can't continue to wait oh I think I'll wait till that resource gets here or I'll wait till that next policy changes or I'll wait till we purchase that next bit of equipment okay but make a decision what are we doing today because there's crews attending things right now and they need some guidance. They need some information. What are we supposed to do? Yeah, absolutely. And I looked at incidents that had happened worldwide. I looked at an incident that had happened in Milan um, that was seen as a bit of a success um, where nobody had been injured, but they'd had a quite a, well, a very, very substantial cladding fire that had engulfed the entire building. But they got away. Yeah. yeah, they got away with sort of three or four uh, people with smoke inhalation, but that was it. Mm. Uh, I looked at that. I, I, I in, uh, you know, almost forensic There's cultural aspects of that as well, isn't there? Because certain places around the world, they are just much better at following orders. <laughs> Some places in the UK, you can you can tell them everything. You can set the sirens off. You can do phased evacuation, whatever. But some some community members just don't listen, which really hurts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've always got to deal with the human element of everything as yes. well. Um, so basically, I came up with a, I came up with a way of working. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's the best. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say it's the worst. There'll be people who might listen to this in a similar position to me and say that's utterly ridiculous. And I've had them discussions with people from other services. It wouldn't said, work for them. Well, that, well, yeah. Exactly, and that's the thing. And I said what we've got to remember is it's bespoke to South York, uh, to, to the brigade that I serve. Um, it, it's bespoke we'll to our out, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's bespoke to our sort of demographic in terms of residential buildings that we've got. And I'll be honest, the crux of it is basically the early implementation of an evacuation based on some triggers that are set out in national occupational guidance and um, creating a structure around that to facilitate an evacuation um, yeah. early in the incident. So not at a point where we've got potentially a fire that's out of control and then we try and start evacuate. Yes. It was very much around three principles. It was identify that there's a need to evacuate, the stairwell and any escape routes, the evacuation while as well uh, as a as a fourth point having some firefighting actions some firefighting tactics to either limit fire spread or at least to try and get on top of it while we facilitated the evacuation now that is in its absolute simplistic view and there's obviously lots and lots and lots of reasons as to why that might not work yeah, yeah, however yeah. what what i felt and i still feel to this day is the more simply you can keep it when it comes to the day of the races there's more yeah. chance of it succeeding um so we very much had marking flats with yellow chalk that are empty mm. so that we know that they're empty and ultimately getting to a point where just like any other house fire the first time we know that all persons are accounted for is when we know that every room's empty mm. and having to work towards getting to that point in a high rise mm. uh, which again has its complexities it has a massive smash on resources mm -hmm. so basically we created that we ran it trialed a few times and we tweaked it here and there and then we put quite a put quite a comprehensive package along uh, together around external fire spread, um, building construction, use of lifts, um, you know, and, th and things like that. We kind of tried to knit it together as the sort of bigger package while also tweaking, tweaking our current procedures for just your generic bog standard fires in high-rise buildings. So mm -hmm. we implemented high-rise packs. Uh, we brought in smoke curtains. We brought in smoke hoods. We brought in you know, a, a bit of an evolution in training uh, in the way that where we're getting water from. What what um, pros and cons do we have of running water from the floor below? You mm. know, the pro is that you 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 plugging in in clean air. You you're going from a place of safety. The con is we're also now compromising three and four doors to get to the fire compartment. That potentially when we open the fire compartment, then going to filtrate smoke through. So how can we stop that? Well, we can use smoke curtains. Or that was the big in, thing. Yeah. Or in a place of safety, we can run our hose from the fire floor if if the situation you know is 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 suitable and what we tried to create was a policy that gave guidance but also 
allowed for flexibility within it, dependent on the situation in which they're seeing, rather than me standing in front of a of a lesson, discussing a council block that's you know straight up in air and it's got two stairwells and we can do this and we can do that. Yeah. The reality of it is now with modern architecture, there's not many buildings in the high rise that look like that. So yeah. it was about creating a policy and a and a way of working that allowed crews to have flexibility within it to to implement it how they see fit. So mm. what, one of the criticisms I got on some of the courses was, well, Dev, this is a bit woolly. And I was like, yeah, on purpose. It's designed <laughs> to be woolly. This is the, this is the skeleton. You build yeah. the meat on it how you want. These the are the skeleton's overarching the strategies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, You put the meat on. If you're comfortable from a professional point of view that that's working, it's over to you. The more like, prescriptive you, know, you get, the more limited its application as well because people yeah. will end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater because it doesn't fit on the building that they've been presented to and they may disregard all of it whereas if you make it woollier as your description there or you you make a more of a skeleton for it they can then adapt it different pieces of meat different applications like you say absolutely and that's what that's ultimately what we what we created um and what and what we rolled out and as i said at the beginning is it the best probably not uh is it the worst probably not is it the best of what we could do based upon our service? And I think it is. Um, and I'm willing to have the debate with anybody around that. Um, and so you've yeah, also so... got to be brave enough to, like you said, just stick your stake in the ground, stick your flag in the ground and say, this is where we are. And then take that feedback. You know, this is yeah. not something that we're going to write in stone that's going to not change and evolve over the next 30 years because everything's always changing. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and that was what I kind of wanted to to put in there that things change and tactics change and 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 there's this flexibility within it to to change things so w- for example we use pa- we use paper and pen if i'm honest as a mm-hmm. as a bit of an evacuation log of where people were and who mm-hmm. needed rescuing there's an absolute expectation that will evolve into technology but by starting it with paper and pen if the technology mm-hmm. fails us in the future we can mm-hmm. fall back to paper and pen whereas if you go to technology straight away and it fails you people lose in, lose confidence in it and don't use it Yes. So if you use pen and piece of paper to start with, then you've got a way to go forward and a way to come backwards. If you don't, then you haven't. Um, mm. So yeah, uh, and like I say, as, as you can probably tell, I'm quite passionate about it because it became part of my life. I was like waking at three in the morning thinking, ah, stairwell protection, how can I do that? You know, that type, mm. like three in the morning, laid there in dark and, yeah, and like, I had to lean over with a bit of paper, scribble a few things down and go, right, I'll, talk, I'll think about that tomorrow. And then I'd go, I'd go charging into work to sort of the area manager. So I'd come up with this great idea and I'd sit down with her and she'd go, yeah, but have you thought about this? And I'd go, mm, probably not. I'll go away and think about that again. <laughs> uh, and then I'd go away and have another think. But but yeah, it was it was absolutely a um, fantastic part of my career, but incredibly hard working and, um, and sobering as well, if I'm honest, because I, I forensically went through the, the Grenfell inquiry. Mm. Uh, I think I, lis- I listened to every session uh, over mm. a period of time. And um, yeah, utterly you know horrendous incident for everybody involved um a, a real real massive massive tragedy but something that we have to learn from as a as a sector and yeah. i think that that's important that people do listen to those well. things you know whether they they go to the gov you know, websites or youtube and see the outtakes or if they have the stomach to immerse themselves in some of the painful conversations that we saw happen to you know obviously the watch manager immediately involved all of the subject matter experts that came in to to criticize to shine light on you've got to imagine how difficult it was for that individual you know for that first person on scene and if you can put yourself into their shoes and at least gleam some and you can say oh that's never going to happen again well okay but let's assume that something like it may happen because yeah. people aren't perfect, you know, mistakes are made all the time, both in the construction of the building, the the amount of information that people take on board when they begin to, you know, accommodate these buildings and they begin to live there. So if we can glean the lessons from it, I forget it was Winston Churchill, I think it was said that, you know, if you're not willing to learn from your mistakes, you're doomed to repeat them. Um, yeah. And that's the, the best articulation of anything that we do in the emergency services. We've got to be willing to front up to them and, and and face those difficult conversations and uh and hopefully learn yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. there's another saying as well yeah. that i particularly like that uh it's, it's a military type saying that um no plan survives contact so you can have the best plan in the world but when the bullets start flying things change 
Uh, so you've nice got to have something it? to kind of fall back. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. It's, it's pretty Have a plan until there. everyone gets punched in the face. and then. Uh... Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take me, uh, before we close, because I want to be super respectful of your time. We spoke for like an hour and a half already. I absolutely love that, mate. I love how conversations can just can just flare. But that is, again, the whole purpose of the podcast, because it shines on the passion that lives within the sector. And with the greatest respect, I don't think you're remotely unique. There's incredibly passionate people all across the sector, certainly in the fire and rescue service. And if we can just open up that can for a little bit and 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 let that excitement and passion flood out um it's amazing the rabbit holes we can go down but i wanted to to talk before we close about you know some of the issues we faced last year with the hot summer that we had because i know um in and around your area and around those services but also across the uk it speaks again about our familiarization or lack thereof with some of the wildfires that we experienced last year and the resulting effects of ppe that got purchased and different tactics and i wonder if you could Glean for a second because we don't think we've finished the circle yet you know, from a UK perspective of how we've adapted right. to some of those challenges. But I know you had a few experiences yourself, uh, the good, the bad and the ugly in in some jobs and some incidents uh, and how they sort of materialised. Yeah, so I left the Grenfell team and I got given a, a well, I got given two stations um, in our obviously services part chain. Um, obviously, the summer, the, the summer came around and we had that very, very prolonged period of, of hot weather and we had you know, we started to get more wide, widespread sort of grass fires and, and things like that. And then um, the, the two days in question, the Monday, um, when obviously uh, it, it kind of started, uh, mm -hmm. I were on duty and um, I'd, we'd had a busy week as a service. And um, I was I was super mindful of my crews had been very busy in our sort of patch. And uh, I'd come in in the morning, the pump were already out. Um, I'd opened my office up, got my uh, main scheme radio on my desk, just listening to sort of the, the, the the messages from the fire ground uh so out and about and it was it was a busy time there's a lot of pumps out and uh my particular station had gone out to a job uh out of our station area uh to back up another crew uh and they were on the way back and i'd just gone in the kitchen to make a cup of tea and i looked out the window and saw an enormous plume of smoke and i thought oh dear um and then i heard the message from control to the crew basically turning them to the job uh, and i thought that's it's a pretty big job that um so i rang the oic and said look i'm conscious that you've been to a job already you've not really seen the station this morning you know have you got enough water have you got enough sun cream have you got enough you know that type of thing if yeah. not i'll come out um so he said yeah we've we've rattled through the water we could do some water and stuff and i says right i'll, I'll come out so um jumps in my car fills the boot full of water uh suntan lotion uh some snacks that i managed to grab from the local shop i think mm -hmm. i grabbed some lucas aid and stuff like that and, and and shot out to the to the to the job um job and I, I didn't know where the where the sort of rvp was it had not been designated so i just headed for the nearest sort of road thought they'll have headed in that way um pulled on the street and there's like a lot of people and it's quite smoky and stuff and there's there's people with hose pipes and stuff and i thought mm. so as i come spin my car around i could see a bit of fire creeping towards these houses and i thought okay that's not so great spun around headed up on found the guys on top of an old pit um old pit top um mm. that had been turned into a bit of a wildlife Sort of reserve, and I drove up onto the pit top, uh, saw the OIC, and I said, "Look, uh, I'm obviously not in charge. I'm not staying because it, it starts to create, create a bit of a conflict. I'm not allocated yeah, to the yeah. job. Uh, here's your water. Here's some looks here, but just be aware. I've just been up onto that road there, and the fire's beginning to creep in there. So just be careful, kind of thing. Mm. Jumps back in my car, drives back to station, uh, gets on station. Here's the radio message, uh, priority message, mate pumps five. Thought, okay." Uh, and then a couple of minutes later, priority message, mate, pump seven. I thought, yeah. oh, dear. Uh, and then my phone started uh, vibrating. It was one of the other station managers saying, you'll be on your way to this shortly. And I was like, possibly. So I'm kind of sat there waiting for the call. And uh, I, I chucked up Google Maps, um, sort of trying to preempt it a little bit. And I had a, had a little look and thought, right, I've got any other different access areas and all that type of thing. Um, and then I got another, there was another priority message, mate, pumps 10, uh, confirmed wildfire. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a bit different. Never been to a wildfire. This is going to be a first. So got turned out um, as commander, I think, or it might be an ops commander. I think they sent a group manager as instant commander. So rang the group manager who's on his way. He'd been my boss in training center and just said, look, Gaffer, um, I'm on my way. I'm more than likely going to be here in front of you because you're coming from further afield. Um, you know, there's a strong chance by the time you get here, Hal have already took over um, because of the complexity and the scale of the incident. 
So I drove back onto the street where I'd come from and already we had some pumps on that street and the watch manager had taken over and was on that street location. Um, so he took over there. I think he had five pumps there and then we had pumps rolling from, from all over the county. Um, so I got there, got a bit of a quick brief off him, which was difficult because the scale of the area was enormous. So to get a real like... Speak about wrapping your hands around something. When it's a wildfire, almost impossible. You feel like you're chasing your tail all the time. So got a bit of an idea of a brief off him and I said, look, I am I will be taking over, but I'm not taking over right now because I need to go up onto the top and have a look with what we're actually dealing with because from where I am now, I can't see it. So uh, talking about PPE, white T-shirt, <laughs> fire leggings, yeah. parks my car up, through a bit of security fence and sets off in the general direction of where I'd left my pumps before. Uh, got up there and couple of pumps and they were you know making a real good stab of trying to put the fire out but by this point they've been there a good couple of hours so they were absolutely on chin strapped kind of thing mm. so i said right i said i'm gonna take over i'm gonna go back down have a chat with the previous incident commander and we're gonna come up with a bit of plan i says right my first plan at the minute is i need to put a bit of structure in place so they're all singing off the same song sheet because at the minute we're a bit fragmented we're a bit all over the place so let's just get a bit of structure and then we'll take it from there so I had a bit of a battle on my hands getting a bit of a structure in place. We got a bit of structure in place, then the, the group manager turned up. and because that can take uh, time in itself. By the time you've done gotcha. that, things have changed. <laughs> and the problem were as well, the radios were absolutely backlogged with, yeah. need more pressure, I need this over here, this yeah, is going yeah, here, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So like, I were having to walk to, to the instant commander to like game and say, right, I'm, I'm taking over. Don't send any more messages. I'm taking over. Yeah. This is what I want you to do in this sector. I'm going to go over there, and that's going to be that sector, and this is what I want them to do in that sector. You happy with your brief? Yeah. You know, put myself, make sure you keep on top of your welfare, keep people out of somewhere you need, make sure they've got PPE on that yeah. type of thing. Right. If you need me, ring me mobile because you'll not get through on radio. So stomps yeah. back over, gives a similar brief to the side. Um, anyway, to, to cut the story kind of short, we managed to keep it on the pit top. Um, and we managed yeah. to keep it out that out the houses. Um, and I take no, absolutely no um, praise or responsibility for that. Uh, the guys and girls absolutely grafted to, to keep on top of it. And then, um, so that that was the end of that day, and I kind of stumped home at about seven o'clock. I walked into the house, and my missus went, "What have you come as?" Like she went, <laughs> "You're not. You, why do you look like that? You're meant to be in charge." And I was like, "I know." And I'm you like, stop doing all this. <laughs> yeah, I was cut. I was covered in like all. I was just literally like everybody that day, just just absolutely minging. Mm. And I remember climbing into bed and thinking, "It can't be like this tomorrow. Like that. That's just <laughs> yeah. ridiculous." Um, and then the next day, I'd been asked to go into a TCG for our group manager, tactical coordinating group, uh, with our local council to just discuss some of the issues that we were facing as a, as a yeah, district. Yeah, because then you have to start dragging in all the local resilience forums and all that sort of stuff because it has such wider effects, doesn't it, these things? Yeah, so I'd been in the meeting and it came to me as fire and said, uh, you know, what's your concerns, Dev, for, for today? And I was like, well, in all honesty, the biggest concerns we've got is, is open water swimming. It's extremely warm. You know, kids are off school. The concern that we might start getting people swimming in expanses yeah. of water. Um, so I said, so from our point of view, you know, we'd appreciate patrols around open water sites, trying to keep people out of the water, you know, messages out on social media and things like that. And, I, and I, as, a, as a caveat, I said, and also like we had a pretty wide scale wildfire yesterday. So, you know, we, we've also got that on our radar kind of thing. And I logged off the Zoom TCG from my office and I thought, right, okay, you know, and straight away my phone rang. Um, and then they describe it as absolute carnage. Like there was a time when I was sat in my car at a job and every single area I looked across the horizon, smoke everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, in in 17 years in the job, uh, nearly, I've only ever heard probably three or four priority messages that, you know, you can tell they sound panicked, priority mm -hmm. message, I need that. And I mm -hmm. think that day alone, I think I heard nine, uh, mm -hmm. 10. Uh, that day on itself, I declared personally two wildfires. Um, yeah. We had major times... incidents declared um, across a couple of services around us, and that's real like twitchy bum time because just because this yeah. thing's happening doesn't mean nobody's crashing their car. Doesn't mean nobody's yeah. you know not stuck in wherever. Yeah. So um, what what ended up happening was well, we got pumps at, at incidents all over. Uh, so they started sending. Uh, station managers and group managers out to incidents to kind of assess them. Do they need an attendance of an appliance or can we actually leave this one? Yeah. Uh, and I got sent to one and I, I drove out there uh, quite quite a distance, drove out there, got there and found a fire like running down an edge line at the side of a road. And I was like, oh, pretty steady, like I can I can deal with this. So 
what, obviously the locals are out and I'm like, has anybody, can anybody give me some water? Like any form of water? Yeah. And this guy's like, I've got some gallon drums. I said, all right, can you fill one up? And sort of my plan was to let it run down the edge row. And when he got to a gate entrance, to sort of damp down everything beyond the gate yeah, entrance yeah. and put like a bit of a fire break in. Yeah. So I drove down to this guy's barn, filled a gallon drum up, chucked it in my car, put a seatbelt on it, drove back to the to the seat. And he's and thinking, the time I got, is this what I pay my taxpayers money for? Yeah. And by is the time the I drove hazards? back, <laughs> the fire jumped the road and was in a, wood, in a wood line and basically vanishing towards an extremely expensive barn conversion. Love it. Uh, so I declared a wildfire, got a phone call from an SM who was working in control saying, Dev, you're not getting anybody. Do you really need somebody? And I'm like, yes, I really need somebody. And they're like, we can't give you anybody. There is nothing. I'm like, okay, sound. Um, okay. Make farmers barrels two, hose, <laughs> hose pipes one. I quickly realized that my gallon drum weren't going to do anything. And then <laughs> just by sheer luck through the smoke, saw a fire engine. So I commandeered it, literally like, right, whatever you're doing, I'm not interested. Get down here. Yeah. Uh, got some hose reels off, managed to we managed to stop it going towards the van conversion and divert it into the wood. And we were actually there for about three weeks after in the wood line, but oh. it stopped it going to someone's house. Um, yeah, like the, the pure scale of that day was just, and I know it's like a bit of a, a bit of a buzzword, but totally unprecedented. I don't think anybody no. really no, mate. Ex- expected it to be on the level it were. And I think we declared a major incident at about four o'clock um, and, SMs and stuff. We were still out of jobs till 10, 11, 12 o'clock. There were mm-hmm. some great stories of two SMs on the local motorway network putting out a car fire with two dry powder extinguishers and a crate of water that they'd managed to get together. Um, <laughs> so, like, yeah, some some amazing, like, amazing stories out of some really, really, like, tragic. Well, that like, stuff like that doesn't mean it's never going to happen stuff. again. And then you look at all the money we've had to spend on, like, the Grenfells and the fire protection teams that we speaking about earlier. And now somebody goes, right. We need to get X. We need to go and buy all these wildfire PPE and we need to go and invest in this. And we're like, people forget it's not a bottomless pot of money. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And that's why and then, and then we've just had all the pay rises and all that sort of stuff. And it's, you do have to sympathize. I know it's hard to try and sympathize with senior leadership teams, but these are some really, really tricky problems. And, and none yeah. of them are unwarranted requests for equipment and resource. And it's tough. Yeah. So as a service after that, we've now created a warm weather plan. So we have trigger points within it. Um, they've sent quite a few of us away on wildfire officer courses. Um, so a few of us have been away and done done wildfire officer courses. We've bought Polaris, we've bought wildfire hose. You know, so we're, we're a bit better prepared. That, that day is one that will definitely stick in my mind throughout my career. Uh, as like, I've never seen anything like that. Um, it were, It were phenomenal, to be fair, phenomenal. And that's yeah. when when people say, oh, you know, it's not like the good old days. No, you're right. It's not like that. It's just different. It's not better or yeah. worse, but it's still an incredible job. It's still really exciting. We still have to improvise, adapt, and overcome. And it still takes those really passionate, quirky, freaky, gregarious problem solvers all over. Men, women, old, young. We need them to keep coming into the sector. People like yourself that didn't intend on joining the fire and rescue service, but picked up a hybrid skill set because they were crap at school and couldn't get a real job and then they become really useful in the emergency yeah. services. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 100%. And just some of the stories that came out of the, the wildfires, you know, um, just prove prove exactly what you said, that the, the diversity of the organisation and, and the people within it and the people who have got the ability to think outside the box and to, to sort of come up with things um, on, the, on the hop is what makes us and the rest of the emergency services is where the real value is in being as diverse as we are, that... You know, there's always someone on the pump or nearby who's got, like, I had an hydrochloric acid spill ages ago, and one of the lads walked up to me. I'd actually trained. It was one of our recruits, and he went, I used to work in a lab before I joined the fire service, and I worked with hydrochloric acid. I was like, right, come with me. Wanted him over there. I was like, right, talk to me about everything that you know about this. But, you know, that's the that's the benefit in it. Um, that's it, man. And, and, yeah, long may it continue, yeah. Love it. Guys, I want to be super respectful of your time. I know we're coming past midday on a Saturday afternoon, but I've absolutely loved that, mate. We've gone in a million different rabbit holes, and I think from from tack vent to, to Grenfell to recruits to crossing over the different pathways in your career, up until the wildfire stuff, there's so many little nuggets that when people wander into the forest of this conversation, we'll hopefully be able to, to walk away from. But I wonder if we could close a little bit of like people that are maybe moving out of a section, because after um, you know the COVID pandemic, a lot of people had that tactical pause and thought about, 
what they enjoy doing, if they love it. And, you know, we've had a colossal amount of listenership, 400 and something thousand people now listen to the pointless conversation, but exciting for me that we've just engaged in the last hour and a half and they will be super excited and motivated. So I wanted to maybe ask as corny as it will sound like advice for anybody that is in their 20s, 30s, 40s, has just done a career switch, maybe like yourself, would you do it again? You know, would you would you join the emergency services now? Because people say, oh, cultural this and that, and it's not like it used to be. And I still think it's incredible. I absolutely love it. I mean, would you join now? Because we're doing a lot of recruitment. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I tell anybody who, who will listen that, you know, there's, there's a fantastic career can be had here. And I have a bit of a saying that I said to recruits, I go back to see recruits now and do a bit of assessing and stuff in my role. And I always turn around to the recruits and say, look, in every walk of life, you're always going to find people who find something negative to say about everything. Yeah. It's up to you to make your decisions. I said, just remember that day, on day one, when you pulled that uniform on for the first time and you undoubtedly checked yourself in the mirror and you undoubtedly felt a swell of pride that I'm giving back to my community. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a service that's respected by the public because we still are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it's something to be proud of. I mean, I occasionally bob into the local supermarket in uniform on my way back to pick a few bits up and, you know, it normally brings a bit of conversation and all that type of stuff. Yeah. It's still an amazing career. And I always said to him, I said, listen, when you get on station or when you bump into people outside a station or in general life who are negative about the career and all that, remember the career. your career is unique to you. Mm-hmm. You be you. And you remember that day when you put that uniform on. And actually, if you ask yourself that question where you put that uniform on and you still don't have that swell of pride, do you know what? Maybe it's not for you. Yeah. And you're not here. It's okay you as know, well. yeah. I want people to be happy. You know, I want people to enjoy the life. We only get one go. It's very short. You get one, one, one turn around. Just enjoy it. But yeah, I would 100% do it again. Yeah. Mate, I've absolutely loved that. Um, I'm going to drop that that message tomorrow because I'm massive thanks because it's through conversations with people like that and, and maybe with yourself and then maybe I go on and speak to a, you know some some experienced person from the air ambulance or wherever it might be. And it's that it's those it's those cultural touch points. It's making conversations with people like and being willing, total honesty to yourself, coming on, taking a risk. Today's the first time we've ever had a conversation together. Could have gone in a million directions and. If you're willing to just put yourself out there, you'd be astonished the value you can add to other people and just make connections like this. So really appreciate that, my friend. Send my love to, to the family and everybody like that. Send my love to everybody back at the stations and stuff like that. And hopefully I'll catch up soon. Top, man. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, talent, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders and please head over to our patreon page and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast please finally hit that follow subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening and wherever you're in the world please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening